My name is Ed Welter and I collect crayons. My intention of collecting crayons came from a collection that I had before, which was uh, actually beer stuff. And when I sold that off, um, I had uh, a package come in the mail from eBay, and it was for something else, but it also included uh, an old box of uh, Crayola crayons. And as I had a lot of uh, wooden shelves that were empty from having sold my uh, beer can collection, crayons fit on those shelves. And so I thought, I wondered how many different uh, crayon boxes there are. And so one thing led to another. And I started accumulating them. In my collection, I probably have about 60 to 80,000 crayons in this room alone. Uh, and that's probably around 3,000 different boxes of various sizes. You'll notice that um, one of my crayons is, a, is just a single crayon, and I'm a box guy. Most of the stuff in here is in boxes, but this crayon is, uh, it was given to Oprah Winfrey during a special presentation uh, on her TV show, and she's the only person that was uh, supposed to get that box, and uh, they made a special color for her called the color purple after the movie, and um, because there are people that collect Crayola colors, the names on the crayons, and there are over 700 and they want every one of them, it is one of the most sought after colors there is because only Oprah theoretically has one. However, I do have one. Um, I have connections and uh, was able to get one. The rarest crayons in my collection or even out there um, really aren't the Crayola crayons uh, as everybody would think. Crayola is just simply the most popular crayon that there has ever been. A lot of crayons from the late 1800s and when they first started um, making crayons in the U.S. are really quite rare. A couple of these, this, this Crayola number 51 and this Rubens, these are the original largest boxes Crayola ever put out. They're from 1903 and they they're very common. They have a Victorian girl, they list the colors. These are mostly colors that you would never find anymore in a modern Crayola box. And they're also colors that Crayola doesn't even advertise are retired. They are just colors that have disappeared off of the face of their color spectrum. After I got the Oprah crayon, I thought that was hard enough, but then I discovered that there was another color that was put out in 2009 and it being 2013 I never had never even heard about it and it was given to Eric Carl the author of The Very Hungry Caterpillar and uh, Crayola did a special promotion and they made an exclusive color and color name for a crayon and gave it to him. Well I went about trying to find one and um, I did. And they put it out in just a little sample box, but um, the important part was just one crayon, and that is the Very Hungry Caterpillar. And so supposedly this is a unique color to Crayola. And um, I got it by asking Eric himself if I could have one, and he sent it to me. Through my research, I put together a website to help other collectors age these and know more about them and I get a lot of emails from that so I communicate with a lot of people around the world. When I started there there literally was no history of this entire industry. None. Not, nobody knew where the crayon was invented and how it progressed to what we know of it today and I thought that was fascinating because most things you can look up and there's some history um, but not with crayons and so I took it upon myself to write the history. You can only do so much online. The physical boxes that I have in my collection obviously help, but you gotta have a date for determining these things. And a lot of times what I've done is I've um, picked up old uh, catalogs. So a lot of people had homeschooling and such, and they would have catalogs. And inside the back of the catalogs, they'd had everything that you need for homeschooling. Some of those would be crayons. And so these things would have dates on them. 
Frustratingly, some of them don't have dates on them, so I do other tricks. Um, they would sell calendars in here, so if it didn't have a date, I could go look at the uh, where they're selling calendars and pull the year off of that. And so it's kind of a little little trick that I picked up. This is a Milton Bradley um, catalog, and it will have crayons in it, and I can compare those and similar crayons and start to age them and put them into a logical progression from the year that they started to current day. The reality is that at this point in collecting for me, my room is full. And I have two rules that um, keep my sanity for a collection. One is that um, it has to be on display or why bother collecting it? And then the other is that it can't leave this room. I've known enough collectors in my lifetime that they, they tend to be hoarders, a lot of them. And uh, maybe it comes with the collecting territory, but uh, my, my personal line for <laughs> drawing between that is that it isn't occupying my entire house. Um, I have a collection, you know, nicely displayed in one single area, and that's my bounds. In this day and age, I don't really have to put something physically up into my collection. I have a website, I capture photos off of wherever I find them, if it's eBay, if it's in a store and I want a picture. I just take a, a shot of that particular crayon box and then I keep it to the collection and make it available for other people to use. In doing the virtual side of collecting, it allows me to satisfy my passion for collecting crayons and discovering new crayons that I couldn't physically put into my collection anymore unless I built a warehouse for them. So I've had to come to terms with what do I do with my collection? And I think I can still continue collecting, but do it virtually. In this uh, digital age, it's very easy to still represent that physical box through pictures that are on my computer. Whether it's the physical or the digital versions, I'm always going to be a collector and I'm always going to be passionate about what I'm collecting. And this is my crayon collection.